Hey everyone, we're going to continue our education on cell communication and regulation, and we're going to look at some specific responses today. We learned the three steps uh, the, uh, in our last lesson to uh, cell communication. First of all being reception, transduction, and then response. All right, so keep those three things in mind as we go through our lesson today. As we're looking at our example today, we're going to really hone in on the endocrine system and the nervous system, as these are two systems that animals rely on for regulation. The endocrine system is that series of ductless glands like the pancreas, the adrenal glands, the testes and ovaries, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and uh, thyroid, all kinds of them there. See how many uh, you can name. And they release their chemicals directly into the bloodstream, as opposed to when we talked about the paracrine uh, response, when a cell releases chemicals and then it affects cells nearby, where the endocrine system is going to actually have to use uh, the bloodstream to deliver the chemical signal around the body. And most cells might ignore that signal, but if it's a target cell that has a receptor for that specific chemical signal, that ligand, then it will respond to it if it receives that signal. Endocrine system signals seem to be a little bit more slow and long lasting. Like for instance, think about puberty, the pituitary releasing chemicals into the blood, and how long puberty takes. Sometimes I think puberty takes forever, uh, but uh, seems to be a little bit more slow and long, uh, long lasting response, but not always since like the adrenal glands, when they release the hormone epinephrine or adrenaline, that's a very fast acting response. The nervous system then is a system of neurons that transmit the electrical signal and then uh, remember, the neurons themselves do not touch each other, so that electrical signal has to change to a chemical signal and jump that synapse, that gap between each neuron. So neurotransmitters are used in between those synapses. These tend to be fast and short-lasting responses. Here's a diagram to help you visualize that. On the left, we have a neuron that terminates at a muscle and then affects a muscle cell who has targets for that and a neurotransmitter coming from that neuron end, jumping the gap to the receptors on the muscle cell itself. Again, those are receptor proteins. And then over here on the right, we have the endocrine gland sending its message or hormone through the bloodstream to its target cells, which also happens to be a muscle cell. Notice the receptor proteins for the hormone from the endocrine system look a little bit different than the receptor proteins that are uh, intended to receive the neurotransmitter coming from the neuron. All of this is like a lock and key system, making a target cell uh, receive only very specific messages, specific signals. So the two different types of messages could be lipid or could be protein. So lipid-based hormones, remember they're very much like the lipid bilayer. They are uh, tend to be hydrophobic, meaning they don't like water, and are lipid-soluble. So these tend to be able to diffuse across the cell membrane and enter cells easily like that. So their receptor tends to be in the cytoplasm or sometimes even in the nucleus. And these tend to bind to DNA as transcription factors or they tend to turn on genes or activate transcription factors. Protein-based hormones though, they're hydrophilic. They're the opposite of the lipid bilayer. They're not lipid soluble, so they can't just diffuse right through they need a carrier. So they bind to receptor proteins on the cell membrane 
if it's a target cell. And then usually they trigger what's called a secondary messenger pathway, which then activates a cascade of events that brings about a change or brings about a product that you want. It could be activating an enzyme. It could be the uptake or secretion of molecules. It all depends on what it is. So let's take a look at this. We have a series of steps. This is just in general what's happening. All right, I activated some animations on my slides here. But here is the steroid hormone coming through the blood. This is a blood vessel here. S for steroid hormone. Steroids, remember, are lipids. And then it arrives here at the lipid bilayer. There's our target cell, this whole thing that we see just a part of, that's our target cell. And there's the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, there's the nucleus, all the things that uh, we know of in a cell. And so step one, here's our steroid hormone being able to diffuse across the lipid bilayer because it has properties very similar to the lipid bilayer, to those phospholipids that are there crosses that cell membrane. So step two, it finds its receptor protein, which is in the cytoplasm. Step three, that activated that little complex right there, and it become a transcription factor. So now it crosses into the nucleus where we know DNA resides. So that uh, transcription factor, remember transcription is when DNA gets transcribed into mRNA. So it just reads a gene. It opens up and unzips DNA on a certain spot, reads just that gene, and makes a transcription of it, which is then called mRNA. mRNA, remember, is able to go through the nucleus pores. It's uh, only single stranded and it's small because it's only the like the copy of a gene out here though in the cytoplasm it finds a ribosome gets read every three letters then remember codes for an amino acid it gets strung together into a polypeptide which then gets folded and joined with other polypeptides and then eventually becomes a protein so the whole idea of this steroid hormone here was to activate a transcription factor because you wanted a gene transcribed into a protein. So we needed a protein from this. And it took all those steps to get it. Now that protein can be secreted out wherever it's got to go. Like maybe... Um, this was a, this protein or this steroid hormone was a growth factor so that, uh, we made protein to grow, could be bone, muscle, gametes, hair, all kinds of different things. All right. How about protein hormones though? So this is just a, a general picture here. We'll get a, a more specific one after this. So this is our target cell. There's our plasma membrane and our cytoplasm. So we know where we're at here. The purple thing is the receptor protein. And the P is the protein hormone. Remember, protein hormones have properties that are different from the phospholipid bilayer. So they don't just diffuse right through. So their receptor can't be in the cytoplasm. It has to be on the lipid bilayer. So there it is, looking all nice and pretty, has a very specific shape so that it receives that protein hormone. Step one, that's the signal. Receiving it, binding to the receptor protein. That activates the cytoplasmic signal. Whoa, yes. <laughs> that is... Uh, activating what's called a G protein. 
And after the G pro protein is activated, activated, if I can talk here, uh, GTP, that is a relative of ATP. So instead of adenosine triphosphate, it's guanine triphosphate. And it binds to this little protein that was on here, gets it all primed, energized so that it can move over to this thing over here. It's an enzyme, and we'll get to what enzyme that is in our next slide. Oh, and there we go again. There is ATP. Oh, there's our cyclic AMP. So ATP gets changed into cyclic AMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. The brain blip there for a second. And remember, that's called the second messenger. And it's a second messenger that activates kinases. It just says activates enzyme here. That enzyme might activate another enzyme. Remember, there can be many of them being activated at once here. Oops, I'm in the way of that. So all of this is transduction. So after uh, reception, we have transduction. That's that cascade of events. And uh, more than one of e each of these can be created. So we might even get amplification from this. And finally, we get our action our response and we'll see what that is in our next slide where we get a little more specific so all of this here is a signal transduction pathway lots of steps to it all right so let's look at it's the same picture but this time we're going to name the things that we're talking about here so epinephrine which is also called adrenaline released by the adrenal glands that's going to be our protein hormone. This is actually a liver cell with its cytoplasm and the protein receptor. Oh, there's where the adrenal glands are on top of the kidneys. So step one, epinephrine or adrenaline bonds with its receptor. So as I said before, this activates the GTP transduction pathway. Oh, there's our GTP. Activates this little protein here to move. It's got to shift overward because uh, the enzyme that it needs to activate is just a little bit further down in the cell membrane. So GTP, it acts just like ATP. It releases that extra phosphate group on the end. Remember, everybody loves to be phosphorylated when you're a molecule, so that activates you. So, while GD GTP will become GDP, but it activates number three right here, adenyl cyclase, and that's an enzyme. Adenyl cyclase is the enzyme that changes ATP into cyclic AMP. So it removes those two phosphate groups. So that cyclic AMP only has one phosphate group, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. That's a long word to say. And then cyclic AMP is that second messenger that's very, very, very commonly used in these transduction pathways. And it activates kinase molecules. And kinase molecules' jobs are to phosphorylate stuff. That's its job. And when it phosphorylates stuff, it activates enzymes. And the enzyme that we really want to activate here, I'm going to set myself in the cell membrane there. The enzyme we really want to activate is glycogen phosphorylase because the action of epinephrine is that we want to break down glycogen into glucose because we need it to make ATP so we can run away from a cheetah right? Or a grizzly bear or a lion or something that's chasing us. We need to make ATP. So we have to activate this enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase. That's our transduction right there. And so our product that we get then, taking glycogen and breaking it apart into glucose and then releasing that glucose to the blood so the glucose can be readily available to all the cells 
so that we can make ATP and run away from a cheetah. Oh yes, that's our response. So reception, then there's our transduction, all that stuff in the middle, and our response in the end is making glucose and releasing it to the blood, of course. So there's a specific example. And using the second messenger system, we get what's called amplification from it. Uh, we don't, as long as this signal, that epinephrine, is bonded into its receptor, uh, we can activate many adenylyl cyclases. We don't have to just activate one of them. If we activate many of those adenylyl cyclases, that means all of those can go on to make many cyclic amps. And those many cyclic amps can activate even more protein kinases, which means we're going to get more enzyme to break down glycogen into glucose. This is called amplification here. So I guess I could have uh, been pressing the button. All of that amplification. So we don't have to just settle for one product, we can have tons of it, and thereby we can get plenty of ATP and run 60 miles an hour and outrun that cheetah. Right? All right. So the second, the second messenger system, the cyclic amp, is a cascade multiplier. It's a very fast response as well. If you've ever experienced an adrenaline rush, you know how it's a fast response. Here's two big players for the nervous and endocrine systems. They're, they're linked. The hypothalamus, can, you can call it the master nerve control center. You can also call it the master gland. Many uh, people also call the pituitary the master gland as well. But when you really look at who's in charge, it is indeed the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is kind of both nervous system and endocrine system. It's a gland, but it also has a nerve fibers as well. So it's kind of both, and it's always monitoring many things like uh, the temperature of your blood, the pH of your blood, what's in your blood. And if it doesn't like what it sees, then it's going to uh, send out hormones to be able to make changes. So the hypothalamus is right above the pituitary gland so the hypothalamus often releases hormones that go down into the pituitary gland which then tell the pituitary to release hormones so uh, that's the posterior pituitary over here the one side of it is kind of controlled by the hypothalamus and then the anterior is on uh, this side there's a broad range of hormones that are released by these glands. And this goes back to like our first week of school. They help you maintain homeostasis by one of the main ways is negative feedback. That if a certain body condition is too high, like maybe temperature is too high, then it releases hormone, activates a gland, and you get another hormone release, which then release or lowers the uh, body condition. So you are, it's called negative feedback because you're going away from uh, what the condition is now. But it sounds bad. It's really not. It's just a good way to be able to regulate things. So let's look at this here. This is the more specific example. And uh, it is on temperature. That's why they call the hypothalamus the thermostat of the body. That let's say your body temperature should be 37 degrees Celsius. That'd be like 98.6 Fahrenheit. It gets too high. The hypothalamus is always checking your blood temperature and it doesn't like it when it's too high. So it sends out nerve signals because it is also part of the nervous system. And it, that causes sweating and it also causes dilation of blood vessels. There's our response right there. And then it lowers the body temperature back to normal. And once you're back to normal, then it shuts down. So, and then you're done with it, which is nice. So it's negative feedback. If your body temperature is too low, hypothalamus doesn't like that. So it sends out some pills to our targets, which 
cause you to shiver or constricting blood vessels, which then brings your body temperature back to normal. And then it shuts down everything back to normal again. Regulation by negative feedback. How about blood sugar? Blood sugar is too high. And so the pancreas releases insulin. And then that goes out and it causes body cells to take up sugar. It causes the liver to take that sugar and store it as glycogen, it reduces your appetite, and everything goes back to normal again. If your blood sugar is too low, your pancreas will release a different hormone that's called glucagon, which then causes cells to release sugar, triggers hunger, causes the liver to release glycogen till everything's back to normal again. Again, negative feedback, a nice way to regulate things. Blood osmolarity, here's another one for you. If you want to look at that, uh, if uh, it's too high, your pituitary doesn't like that. So a hormone called ADH gets released, which increases water absorption or also increases thirst and brings you back to normal again. If it's too low, then the nephron, which are those little filtering units in the kidneys, releases a renin and then also angiotensin and aldosterone and you get increased water and salt reabsorption until it's back to normal again. All for homeostasis. So here's a whole bunch of different hormones and their targets. If you're interested where the target cells are, thyroid stimulating hormone, the thyroid gland, and I'll just let you read through those yourself if you like. These are all coming from the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in conjunction. Uh, generally the pituitary won't release a hormone unless the hypothalamus tells it to do so with some exceptions of course. There's some interesting studies going on with these different hormones, like for instance, the hormone prolactin, you can find it in all these different animals, but it does just different things. For uh, mammals, it causes milk production, but in birds, fat metabolism. In fish, it helps regulate salt and water balance, and in amphibians, it's responsible for the process of metamorphosis and maturation. It's in the same gene family as growth hormone. So what does that tell you about these things? Well, evolution, right? Homologies are mean similarities that these evolve from the same gene family, maybe involve gene duplication to get them. All right, I, I hope some of these more specific examples here with the endocrine and nervous system help to uh, solidify what you've been learning in cell communication. Make sure if you have any questions that you ask them. Uh, speaking of regulating pituitary hormones, uh, this is Robert Wadlow. He grew very, very tall. I can't even imagine if I stood next to him what the size difference would be as I'm only 5'3". Uh, he had a tumor that was pressing on his pituitary gland which then the pituitary gland constantly was releasing hormones that caused growth. And so he grew to 8 feet 11. I can't even imagine that. Uh, although he didn't live a very long life, very sadly enough. So again, let me know if you have any questions.